to see everybody out this morning. If you haven't got one of these, we prepared uh, for you today. You're more than welcome to grab one as the back line is up tucked back there in front of you. Uh, just a free Sunday question. If you haven't answered yours yet, just something to get you thinking uh, on this thought of learning to love yourself. How do you define self-worth? How important is self-worth to you in your walk with God? You know, all over the world, people are wondering, what is their value? We hear it way too often. What is my worth in society? Where is my place in this world? People create art about it, songs about it, movies about it, TV shows about it. I'd make the argument someone right now somewhere is probably talking to a psychiatrist asking a question something like, does anyone even care who I am? Sadly, you've probably heard people say it before. Maybe you've asked that of yourself. One particular piece of pop culture that I always think of when exploring this topic is from a musical here in Epicanto. It's a song called You Will Be Found. It's a beautiful song. And the beginning of the lyrics read, and I'll just read them. It's not the same as today. As you're listening to this song, you usually get the point. It's the lyrics are great. Have you ever felt like nobody was there? Have you ever felt forgotten in the middle of nowhere? Have you ever felt like you could disappear and fall and no one would notice? truth is, today there's an epidemic of people, including Christians, who have little to no self-worth. God actually has a lot to say about self-worth, including making loving yourself as part of the second greatest commandment. A lot of times we stop. Let's read this together. Matthew 22, 36 through 40. This is kind of our key verse for this lesson. Listen, a lot of times we drop off here in the second commandment. Watch what Jesus does here. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? In verse 36 there, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like, love your neighbor. Let me stop there. Love your neighbor. And that's all he says. That's what a lot of Christians and a lot of people think. I've got to love everybody else. I, I, I've got to go out there and I've got to give and give and give and give to everybody else. And we don't focus on the next part as yourself. Jesus tells you to love yourself. You don't hear that too often. I don't know why we stop there. But we are commanded. What did Jesus say? And the second is like it. So he said it's the second greatest commandment. It's very much like the first. To love yourself and to love your neighbor as yourself. All the law, the prophets, and Abraham. Today, we will be examining why mankind's self-worth is seemingly at an all-time low. It it, it just does seem that way. Maybe maybe it's the pandemic we all went through, the trauma we suffered from that, or or whatever it is. I'm not sure, but we're really low. And learning why God's value of us is so much more than that of our fellow man. So our first point today is God loves me regardless. Just like a father loves a child... God's love does not ebb and flow when it comes to his children. It's ridiculous to think that I have a three-year-old daughter and a baby on the way, and that one day I wake up and this morning she does not want to wear princess dresses all of a sudden. Don't know why, but has no desire to wear princess dresses. I think that's what Kate said about it. That's mildly annoying, but that's your life. It is what it is. But I don't go, you know what? You're just a little bit annoying today, so guess what? My love, uh, it's gone. No, on the contrary, no matter her difficulties in her three-plus years of life, every single day, my love for my child has grown and has grown. And it's not just blood relations. My wife is the same thing. They talk about the more years you're married, I love my wife more than I ever have. And it sounds corny, but I do love my wife more than when I first married her. You know why? We have difficulties. We have squabbles. We get on each other's nerves, but every day my love for my girl has grown, especially now. I appreciate her, and just like God loves us, it's the same thing with marriage and the joy of a child. It's the same way with God. God loves us, for us, is not based on what we can do for God. If you think love is based on what people do for you, you're in the wrong 
wrong uh, vein of love there. Or how good we behave. But God loves us just who we are. Our flaws and all. I often say when I stand in the back of church, it's a beautiful scene. I wish you all could see it. All the people in the church. We're all broken. We're all messed up. We all have different problems. We have different pasts. We have different failings. And we all come together to do what? To lift each other up. We are a support group. That's what we are. That's what God designed a church for. Not to be perfect people, not to be flawless people, but to be flawed people who make each other better. When it's hard for us to love ourselves, we need to know that there is a God who loves us and finds us worthy just as we are. That doesn't mean you should not improve yourself, but where you're at in life, God loves you where you're at. He's wanting you to do things to improve yourself, but he loves you where you're at. Just as God knew Jeremiah before he was formed in his mother's womb, you see there in Jeremiah 1, God also knows us and loves us. It says there in verse 4 of Jeremiah 1, The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Just as Jeremiah, God knew him before he was formed in the womb. God knew us, and guess what? He loved us. Every single step of the way in our lives, he has loved us. Did you know that Jesus is not the only carpenter in his family? I'm talking about God is joking around with himself. God is also a carpenter. I don't think it's by chance that Joseph was. His earthly father. He told Noah, God did, how to build the ark. He gave dimensions of the temple. There are so many instances where God has a design, has a plan, and he knows carpentry. He is a creator at the root of it all. He is a creator who built many things, and he built us with a purpose. Get that last point. He built us with a purpose. We have a purpose. Psalm 139, 13 through 15. Psalm 139, 13 through 15 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of of the earth. How beautiful is that? I was fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's just not one of us in here. It's not one person. Donnie, you were fearfully and wonderfully made. Everybody else, you can just idolize Donnie. He's in the front there. He's doing great. Look at him. Wonderfully and wonderfully made. I'm very proud of him. Fearfully and wonderfully made. No one else is. No, that's not true. We all, every single one of us. You know what? The people in jail, they're fearfully and wonderfully the people you see on the news, Justin Timberlake, Timber Timberlake, just got a uh, DUI. Oh, what a terrible life he has. God fearfully and wonderfully made him the lowest person you've never heard of, the not famous person that no one will ever hear of, that probably doesn't have many people in their lives at all, who's sitting at home, a lady I passed today, smoking a cigarette, obsessed with her phone, on her porch, going like this, had no interest in looking at church, it doesn't look like. In her pajamas, 9 o'clock in the morning, 9.30 in the morning. God fearfully and wonderfully made her. Self-worth is the internal sense of being good enough and worthy of love and belonging from others. As Jesus described in John 15, 1 through 8, so thank you so much for Donnie for reading that. We are the branches of the vine. Who is the vine? Jesus is the vine. When we try to live apart from him, we are like what? What did he read? Or like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. When we think our life is meaningless, let's look at how attached we are to Jesus. Because I'm telling you, when you are not with Jesus, your life does become meaningless. Eventually, your life becomes like these branches. The further and further away you go from Jesus, you are like these branches that are be thrown away 
They're withering. They're worthless. We do that to ourselves. No child starts away from Jesus. Every single baby born is with Jesus. They start with Jesus. And as time and experience and things in life happen, we grow farther and farther away from Jesus. Maybe you're this close to Jesus, and maybe you're growing. Maybe you're blossoming. Your life is blossoming. I was telling a guy the other day, I said, I'm so proud of you that you get to see the joy of family. Our society tells you that family, that children, that wives, that husbands are often a burden keeping you from achieving your ultimate successful goals. That's what society tells you. God does not tell you that. He tells you that family will help you. They will help you grow. They will help you mature. They will help you grow fruit. And I told him, I said, I'm so happy that you get to see that exact thing in your life. Keep going that direction. It is a wonderful thing to have a family. It's a wonderful thing to have people around you. Too often when we live apart from Jesus, we get stuck in this cycle. This is an interesting cycle. And I thought a lot about this cycle. Our self-worth gets so low that we stop loving others and or letting love come into us. That's so important. Letting love come into us. Too often we become an unlovable person. These are the people that just don't want to talk to anybody, don't want to put themselves out there. Meeting new people and and trying to get with people of like mind and like faith and trying to grow yourself. Our self-worth gets so low, we stop loving others. I don't even want to meet anybody else. I don't even want to talk to anybody else. I'm going to embarrass a guy here today, Pete, my my friend. This is how I met Pete. Pete. Funny story. I wasn't going to use it today, but at the end, I'm going to throw it in there again. He's a great guy. If you don't know him afterwards, meet him. He's a really good kid, actually. He's a really good kid. He came in. He was my appraiser for my house. I was selling a house. I had to go somewhere else, and this guy's late. I'm like, what in the world is going on? This guy's late. 30 minutes late, 40 minutes. I could have been mad. Oh, I could have been angry. Where's this guy at? But now it's on my head. I'm like, what? Maybe something happened to this guy. I hope he's okay. So I give his office a call. He comes in, and I'm like, him and his wife act like I start talking to them. By the end of the conversation, no, we could care less about the house. We were having conversations about God. And we were praying together. And that's how Pete became my friend. He texted me about every single day. Just an affirmism, just something to lift me up. And I tell you what, I need those, and I appreciate them. He's helping me grow and helping me a better person. If I didn't want to love people or care about people, Pete didn't want to. He would have came in and done his business and left and said two words to somebody. There are people out there who need love, and guess what? You also need love. And there's not a limit where you're like, okay, I'm 100% loved out, and I'm good. You can always be loved more, and you can always give more love. That's the beauty of love. 1 John 4, 7 through 8 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not, does not know God, because God is love. We have a song, God is love. Two in the cycle. We stop loving others and or letting love come into us, so what we do, we reject God's love. God is love. Luke 10, 16 says, whoever listens to me, listens to, or listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. But whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. We're not rejecting him. We reject God's love, so we reject who? God. God is love. John 3, 19 through 20. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. There are tons of people, there are tons of things you could have done today to not being here. You could have done so many other things. But you chose today that I need some light in my life. I need God in my life because when I have God in my life, I am better. There are people stuck in a cycle that they are rejecting God's love and they are rejecting God, and they don't know how to get out of the cycle. I'll tell you that. It's not that they're always doing it on purpose. They are stuck in a cycle. Maybe it's from family or things like that. They don't know how. And sometimes you just flipping that switch in their head 
and shining a little bit of light to help them open a door to a lot more light. The next one in the cycle, we reject God, so everything feels meaningless, including love. Do you ever hear someone say, I'm just numb? I am just numb to everything in the world. I had a friend who just lost his mother. His father dropped dead at Kroger down here just randomly after that. And then his father-in-law moved very close to him in a matter of nine months. He said, I'm just numb to it all. I'm just so numb. I can't feel anything. That's what we get to when we reject God as well. We get to something so everything becomes meaningless. If you've never read Ecclesiastes 1 with Solomon, just read it. It's very sad. It's not a happy read. He's saying the same exact thing here. Everything is meaningless in in verse 2. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless without God. Solomon tried it all. He's told us from the grave. He wrote books about it. He waxed poetically about it. He said, guys, I've tried it all. I'm telling you, it's all meaningless unless you're with God. And we still say, you know what? I don't know. I just think when Solomon says, I'm going to go try it. It might be more meaningful for me. You see celebrities. I mentioned Justin Timberlake. Will Smith. I was watching. We were at a a, a duck pin bowling yesterday. And they had like 90s videos on. I'm like, well, there's Justin Timberlake. His life's a mess. There's Will Smith. He came on with Men in Black. And I'm like, well, that's a... He's, he's a mess, you know. Like None of these people you look up to, you're like, wow, I'd really like to be them. They're trying all these things, and they're saying it's meaningless. There are tons of artists and musicians and famous people and not famous people, people who just live their life the way it was, and they're all saying the same thing. It's all meaningless. At the end of my life, it was all meaningless. When we reject God, everything feels meaningless. Everything seems meaningless, so we have no self-esteem. There's the cycle. There's the cycle. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. You remain in me and I in you. You will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. Kevin Garnett, a couple years ago, uh, he had a big thing. He's a basketball player. He plays for Boston Celtics. He said, anything is possible with God. Nothing is possible without God. They might look like on Instagram. They might look like on Facebook. They might look like on TikTok that they have everything. Do you ever wonder why these social media influencers have a spotless, clean, perfect house? And they're jumping in pools and stuff like that. And like, look how great my life is. Because they don't really live there, folks. It's all a facade. And you see their lives slowly start to derail the further and further they get from God. We develop a generally negative overall opinion of oneself because we are trying to define ourselves by ourselves. We are a nation, a world that tries to define ourselves by ourselves. However, God tells us the best laid plans will fail without him because his purposes always prevail. When we are failing in life, make sure that the plans we are making are not based on this world but rooted in God. No branch can bear fruit. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. You can try and try and try. It's like running your head into a wall. Eventually, people go, you know what? I'm sick of the headaches. Or they go, I need to be rooted in God. This is kind of what started this whole discussion uh, or thought in my mind about the self-worth. And I'm like, I really haven't heard anything about self-worth. Is uh, The next point, one man's junk is another man's treasure. I was reading about Solomon and King Hiram. King Hiram helped him give the cedar. He gave him all the wood and stuff for the temple. Really nice thing to do, right? And so Solomon, in return, gives him 20 cities. They happen to be the 20 cities of Galilee. King Hiram goes to the cities of Galilee, looks at them, and calls them Kabul, which means good for nothing. Thanks for the good for nothing cities. These cities are where who was born? Jesus. That's the region he was born. I believe this is why Jesus was born there. In a region of 20 cities that were completely worthless. This is the land where he would grow up. This is the land, we talked about it on a couple Wednesdays ago. God makes no mistakes in the Bible. Every word, every a, every of, every the was picked for a reason. That's humbling to realize too. But every purpose on life, he could have had Jesus born anywhere on the earth. And he chose to have him born 
in Galilee, this worthless land. Do you remember in Jesus' day when they had the expression, can anything good come from Nazareth? And someone said, surely the Messiah is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Because historically this was not an impressive region, even in the days of Solomon. And evidently it hadn't changed too much in recent years. In the 1860s, Mark Twain, it was always good for his wit, he came to these regions. This is what he wrote. I'm going to read this verbatim because it's, it's Mark Twain and, and uh, he's way smarter than I am. So he comes here to Magdala, part of Galilee. He says, it's not a beautiful place. It's thoroughly ugly and cramped, squattily, uncomfortable, and filthy. Just the style of the cities that adorned the country since Adam's time. The streets of Magdala are anywhere from three to six feet wide and reeking of uncleanliness. The houses are from five to seven feet high and are built upon arbitrary plan. The ungraceful form of dry goods box. The sides are daubed with smooth white plaster and tastefully plateaued with discs of camel dung placed there to dry. This gives the edifice the romantic appearance of having been riddled with cannonballs. And Tiberius, he went there. The, the, its people are examined best at a distance. That's a nice way to put your ugly. They are particularly uncomely. Squalor and poverty are the pride of Tiberius. We find ourselves in Endor, another part of Galilee, famous for its wits. Remember her in the Old Testament? Her descendants are there yet. They were the wildest horde of half-naked savages we have found thus far. They swarmed out of the mud beehives, out of the hovels, out of the gaping caves, a begging, screeching, shouting mob, mob. Dirt, degradation, and savagery are Endor's specialty. Oh, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? They do not mind dirt. They do not mind rags. They do not mind vermin. They, are, they do not mind barbarous ignorance and savagery. That's from Mark Twain in his book, The Innocents Abroad. You get the idea. This land is nothing special. And this is where God chose our Lord and Savior to grow up. A region of 20 poverty-ridden cities, which is probably too good a word for them. They were ugly, impoverished villages. Friends, every day we're given a choice, no matter where we're from or what background we have. Maybe your life is like these villages. Maybe you feel like your life is like the terrible spot in Galilee, and you cannot get out of it. You cannot rise above it. I truly believe that's why God let him be there, because he was able to create the greatest thing ever. He was able to be a perfect person from this terrible city. Each and every one of us has baggage. We've hurt others. Others have hurt us. We've lived selfishly. We've been angry, hateful, jealous, bitter, prideful, lustful, and impatient. And if you're just realizing that every single one of us in here have had those sins, wake up. None of us are perfect. If you're pretending to be perfect, you're not. We all know this. We've all done things we're ashamed of, and it's easy to cringe at these things. We all have that past moment. Think of it right now. I'm sure you can think of it very easily. That past moment or two or three or four moments when you're like, man, I just don't know how God can forgive me for that. You can choose to wastefully track your life experiences, or you can be intentional about inviting God to recycle your trash and bring forth his treasure. Psalm 113.7 says, he raises the poor from the depths and lifts the needy up. Friends, there's nothing we can do to make him think any less of us. He loves you where you are at right now. The last point, am I worth it? Yes. Can I put an exclamation point there for a reason? Yes, you are worth it. Stop being a terrible gift receiver. My wife tells me I'm a terrible gift receiver. She did such a great job on Father's Day, other than we got our house got broken, which was awful. But uh, thankfully, there's some insurance that took place. They're like, oh, look, it's already been, someone's already robbed my house. It's a lot of joy this year. I'm glad. Um, but, yeah, that was terrible. But, yeah, my wife went all out. She, like, uh, you know, she did a wonderful job. And I'm like, and I don't know how to give her. She's like, this is great. She's like, no, you're just a gift receiver. 
And I thought, like, in my head, I'm like, this is a great reaction. Like, I, was, I love the gifts he got me, but I can't react well. Don't be like me, especially with the greatest gift that ever was, the one from God. Do we d- deserve the gift of God's grace? No, but we all received it, so receive it well. You, <laughs> grace and the gold tickets, and I put this one. We all know Willy Wonka. We know the story of Charlie Bucket finding a golden ticket and going to Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. It was a prize that everybody wanted, and everybody, when he found it, we'll give you $50. We'll give you this. Kids, come back. We want that golden ticket. Everybody wanted it. We have a similar thing. It's called grace. This is favor we can never earn or deserve. It's like we've all been given the golden ticket to Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. We didn't deserve it, just like Charlie Bucket found the money and went in there and did it. We don't deserve it, but we have all been given grace. Some people say you must accept grace. Like, how can you accept something that's already been given to you? God's grace has been given to us already. We can't accept it. It's already happened. If you want to know what God's grace looked like, Look at John 3.16. It says, for God so loved the world that he what? That he gave his only son. If you are a parent, you know how hard that is. If you're not a parent, I'll tell you right now. You can take me a million times. You try to hurt my daughter, you're going to have some serious problems. For God to give his only son is remarkable and should humble you. So that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That's his grace. Jesus is the embodiment of grace. He came. He died on the cross for us. It is already given to us, folks. It's not something we can earn. It's not something you need to go look for. It's already happened. His life, his death, his resurrection is literally the embodiment of his grace. God favors humankind enough that he sacrificed his son for us. I'm not sure why he favors us. He favors us over the angels and over the animals. People say, my dog is the best version of me. Animals are way better than us, like 99% of the time. They're such great creatures because they're so innocent. But he didn't favor the animals. He favored you and I. What did God's grace, Jesus, tell us in John 14, 15? If you love me, you will keep my commands. There's a lady named uh, Brene Brown famous uh, uh, psychiatric circus stuff like that. She has an interesting way of describing loving someone you care so much. She states, it is the same as believing in something with your whole heart. I love that, 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 that way she puts it, loving something fiercely. Do you love God? Do you love Jesus fiercely that nothing will get in your way of serving him? Or were you today just going, you know what, this guy didn't deserve it. told me to go to church. I'm still not sure why. Glad I come to the same building they went to. Go to this one. Go to this one. Go to the one with the green light. Do you catch that line or where were you? Are you loving Jesus and God fiercely? Are you believing them with your whole heart? Or are you just kind of like, you know, I kind of just kind of believe. To believe in Jesus is to love Jesus. You either love Jesus or you don't. As part of his commandment is to love yourself because you are worth it. Yes, they're all complicated. We went to watch Inside Out 4. A couple of us did. It's a great movie. If you don't know what Inside Out movies are, they they take a a little girl and they look inside her head and the emotions are the characters and all the things that are going on. Well, not to spoil anything for you, but this, this girl's trying to find herself. She's 13, she's trying to find herself, and, and, and toward the end of the movie, there's this spot where, you know, they keep trying to make her a good person. I'm a good person. They want all these emotions inside her, want her to feel like she's a good person. And they try to get rid of all the things that make her feel like she's a bad person. And at the end, they realize, and this is a uh, spoiler a little bit, I guess, that the war inside your own head, she has a great quote. And I had to look this up because it's really hard to find right now, but it, it, uh, it's just a beautiful quote. Where she's realizing, they're, they're all realizing that all these moments in her life make her feel so bad. She can't throw away her anger. She can't throw away her grief. She's battling with these things. But they always make us feel so bad. And they will always make us realize the truth of where we are and who we are. She says, I'm selfish. I? I'm not good enough.
success is everything. And they think it's everything. A night isn't everything. I'm a good friend. I am strong. the old movie where meanwhile the grandpa Joe is always up in the you know he's bedridden he's never been but he's he just sat in his bed his family's going to poverty and then Charlie brings him the gold ticket and he he's amazingly gets up and he starts dancing and singing and wow what, he wasn't bedridden he didn't, he didn't have a leg problem look at him he's fine now they always get caught up on that but they don't realize that grandpa Joe what he does is he finally realizes he has something to live for he jumps out of bed at Ridden State and he starts walking and dancing and singing. He says, I never thought my life would be anything but catastrophe. That cycle we talked about, I never think anything's going to be anything good. Did you start your day with a prayer this morning thanking God for being here? Start the cycle the other way. I never thought my life would be anything but catastrophe, but suddenly I begin to see a bit of good luck for me because I have a golden ticket. We don't have a stupid piece of paper for the golden ticket. You have something so much better. And if you are not living for Christ, what are you doing? Every morning, no matter the difficulty that we have in life. And yes, life is difficult. I'm not saying it's all peaches and cream. It's very difficult. My friend who lost three sets of people he loved in nine months, that's hard on him. And that is not to be made light of. But every day, if we focus on what God's plan is for me, the reason you're here and other people might not be, there's a reason for it. Focus on that. We need to stop being like the bedridden version of Uncle or Grandpa Joe. We have something so much more valuable than that. We have a God who believes in us, a God who sacrificed everything for us, and he is calling us home. We always mention the steps of salvation and the things we run to when we sin. But it says very clearly in the Bible that he wants us to hear Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. You have to have faith. You have to hear it to believe it. You have to believe. John 8, 24 says, therefore I say to you, you will die in your sins for unless you believe I am he. You will die in your sins. You will be over here thrown away. Do you understand that? If you do not believe that Jesus is the son of God, you will die in your sins. You will not be a part of that line. You have to repent. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. I want to change my life. I don't want to continue in this pattern. I don't want to feel worthless anymore. I have a buddy, real quick, this is a story, and it's so sad. I keep telling him, I said, you need to go to church. You need to be baptized. You need to put on Christ. He knows that. We've talked about it. He knows who Jesus is. He knows he's son of God. He knows he needs to be baptized. He knows that he needs to go to church. You know what he does? He doesn't do it. And so things start to look up as he starts to give his life to Jesus, and you could see it. And then he comes crashing to the faith. I said, if you had a community around you of people or believers, guess what? You would have been lifted up by now. If you had a community of believers around you and you need some money for a car, guess what? It's gonna, I guarantee you it will happen. People want to fight with you. But when you are apart from the vine, it's a lot harder to fight with them. Confess, Peter said to them in Acts 2, 38, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Be baptized. It is so important to be baptized and to be left over. Every single person... After the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost were baptized that day. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. We need to be baptized. Live faithfully unto death. Revelation 2.10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you in prison. I want you to pay attention to this very last one. Be faithful unto death.
bedridden state like Grandpa Joe and start living like golden ticket Grandpa Joe. Start living with self-worth, knowing that you were worth so much that the creator of all gave his son for you because you are worth it. I cannot say it any clearer than that. I've quoted down to you. I want you to know the rest of the lyrics in that song again. says, well, let that lonely feeling wash away. Maybe there's a reason you'll be okay. Because when you don't feel strong enough to stand, you can reach me. Reach out to me. And oh, someone will come running. And I know they'll take you home. Even when the darkness is crashing in your room. When you need a friend to carry you. When you're broken on the ground. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep of Israel? Sure he does. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons do not need to repent. Lost sheep be found. The lost be found. You, I said it so many times, oh my, I have a powerful faith in that. You are the only you that can ever save me. I don't know how they determine the snowflakes there are to people that are alike now. There are not two humans that are alike. You can look like people, you can talk like people, you can act like people, you can try to be like someone, but you will never be them. You are only an individual. You are only unique. God made you that way. You are the only you that will ever live. You are so important to God's story. Go out and tell others your story because the gifts that God gave you are worth it and you can share that story. Find your self-worth in the only place you can find it, in the Lord. If you need to be baptized or if you need to come to the prayers of the congregation, come as we stand and sing together.